watching News 25. Local coverage you can count on. News 25 is brought to you by J.K. Nelson Law. Voted best of Pahrump for four years. Give them a call, 775-727-9900. News 25 is also brought to you by Gunny's Air Conditioning and Heating. New, service, and repair. Call Gunny's, 775-727-6800. Hello and welcome to this edition of News 25. I'm Yunette Gentry and thanks for tuning in on Ace Country Radio and we're also streaming on your Roku devices. It is Tuesday, April 23rd. In our top story out of Las Vegas, a fatal collision early this morning in the North Las Vegas area results in one death. RJ Camacho reports. Jason Ernest of Mount West Lawyers. Don't be bullied by insurance companies. Call me, 775-727-9500. At approximately 5 a.m. on Pecos Road and Cheyenne Avenue, a fatal collision occurred in North Las Vegas. According to the North Las Vegas Police Department, a 2019 Ford F-150 was heading north on Pecos at the same time a man was approaching southbound on Cheyenne while riding a 1999 Suzuki motorcycle. The motorcycle crashed into the pickup truck as the truck turned left and the rider of the motorcycle was ejected from their vehicle. Medical personnel pronounced him dead at the scene. Currently, police are still investigating this accident and believe that impairment was not a factor in the crash. Anyone who may have information regarding this case is urged to contact the NLVPD at 702-633-9111 or you can contact Crime Stoppers at 702-385-5555 to remain anonymous. Well, this post-Earth Day, I hope you're all green like me, wearing green and keeping it on your mind and in your heart like Clark County commissioners who are going green after a vote to fund more new electric vehicles. Samantha Roberts has this story. Last week, the Clark County Commission voted to approve over $2 million for the purchase of 57 new Mustang Mach-E all-electric vehicles to add to their fleet. The county's goal is to have a fully EV fleet of vehicles in place by 2050. Currently, Las Vegas has a total of nine completely electric vehicles. Henderson currently has one electric vehicle and 14 hybrids. The Mach-E's are said to be purchased from Godden Ford. The cost of each vehicle will be just under $36,000 and have been deemed cleaner for the environment. The vehicles have a 1.2 hour charge time at 440 volts and can do 0 to 60 miles per hour in 6.3 seconds. The vehicle's range is estimated to be 250 miles. And a Canadian mining company is proposing construction of a new lithium mine right here in Nevada. However, some environmentalists say that the site has potential for endangering a species of plant that does not grow anywhere else in the world but here. The Biden administration is currently taking a significant step towards an expedited environmental review of what may potentially be the third lithium mine in the U.S. However, it's anticipated for there to be legal challenges regarding this due to conservationists saying there is a threat to an endangered Nevada wildflower known as the TM buckwheat plant. Officials with the Bureau of Land Management as well as the Interior Department stated that this progress represents another step by the Biden-Harris administration administration to support the responsible domestic development of critical minerals to power the clean energy economy. However, environmentalists who are fighting against the construction of the mine say that instead this is the latest example of the administration's lack of consideration towards U.S. protections for native wildlife and rare species in an effort to slow climate change and reduce the reliance on fossil fuels in addition to cutting down greenhouse gas emissions. Patrick Donnelly, who is the Great Basin Director at the Center for Biological Diversity has called this, quote, 
greenwashing extinction. He spoke further on the matter, stating that, We believe the current protection plan would violate the Endangered Species Act, so if BLM approves it as proposed, we almost certainly would challenge it. According to the Center for Biological Diversity, the Bureau of Land Management has rushed the review of the mine. They discovered this after obtaining internal documents through a request made under the Freedom of Information Act. With worldwide demand for lithium being projected to grow six times in the next decade, Nevada currently houses the only lithium mine in the U.S. A second lithium mine is currently being constructed north of Reno near the Oregon line. Ioneer, which is an Australian mining company that's been planning to dig for lithium at Rhyolite Ridge for years, was reported to have adjusted their latest blueprint in order to reduce the destruction of critical habitat for the endangered plant which doesn't exist anywhere in the world except Nevada. Ioneer's managing director, Bernard Rowe, stated that the lithium production can begin as early as 2027 and went on to further state that Rhyolite Ridge will help accelerate the electric vehicle transition and secure a cleaner future for our children and grandchildren. However, it has been argued that no amount of destruction of this critical habitat is acceptable. With so much confrontation regarding the creation of this lithium mine, it is uncertain if construction will progress or if it will be halted in order to protect the endangered plant. All right, don't grab that remote. News 25 will be right back with information on a family fun fundraiser. That and much more when we return. You're watching News 25. Local coverage you can count on. Welcome back to News 25. Well, Southwestern Wilds Incorporated holds their family fun fundraiser and all proceeds are going to help support wild horses and burros. So we're speaking with the organization to tell us more. Hey, we are having a wonderful day out here at the Death Valley Marketplace. We want to have special thanks going out to Alina and Tim, who are the owners. We are Southwestern Wilds. We are the new nonprofit, the 501c3, that is dedicated to carry and continue on our success with the Fred, Rosie, Friends and Family Herd. What you see here today is kind of an intro to what we've done, where we're going, and where we need to get. We are reaching out to the community and other organizations to help join the coalition, work together for not only the benefit of our Mustangs and burros, but our environment in general. We work closely with government entities and stakeholders, our community, and we all need to make a difference together and we can do that. Hi everyone, I just wanted to say thank you for coming. We really appreciate you being here and all of your support. Our future goals for this 501c3 Southwestern Wilds is to eventually reach out to the kill law, or the kill lots in Oklahoma and Texas. We will be rescuing them. We will be having live feeds as we're doing that. And also, please don't forget to join our Facebook, Southwestern Wilds, Outreach, Advocacy and Rescue, and our Fred's Posse, which a lot of you are already part of. We are all together as one, and we did an awesome job yesterday, and I want to thank the search squad who uh, assisted in, re in re helping rescue a uh, baby foal that was separated from his mother, and uh, the stallion that was a survivor of the ones that were killed on the 19th at 10.30 p.m. So thank you, everyone. We very much appreciate it. Southwestern Wilds is a wonderful organization that you can be a part of. Please sign up for our volunteers and you can make baskets, you can help our search squad to be able to find animals that were hit by a car or lost in the desert. And we also have uh, a petition that we would like you to sign to get more fencing, get more safeguards such as flashing signs, cattle guards, um, lighting, and we need volunteers to help us put up fencing along Roadrunner. You can get an application on our webpage 
at Southwestern Wiles, Inc. We hope you can volunteer to help save our horses and burrows from any accidents or harm. So please contact us at 775-513-1316 if you would like to volunteer or have questions or go to our Facebook page, Southwestern Wiles, Inc. Thank you very much. What a beautiful cause for such beautiful animals. And in more regional news, groundbreaking began earlier today for the high-speed rail line that will connect Las Vegas to the Los Angeles area. Today, groundbreaking began for the Brightline West high-speed rail station that would connect Las Vegas to the Los Angeles area. This rail line has also been dubbed the first of its kind in the U.S., and the company predicts that by 2028, millions of ticket buyers will be boarding trains. In attendance at the groundbreaking ceremony was Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, Governor Joe Lombardo, Senators Jackie Rosen and Catherine Cortez Masto, and members of the Nevada Congress congressional delegation alongside local officials and labor leaders. Officials hope that this rail line will help alleviate the congestion on the I-15 where drivers are often dealt with miles of traffic when trying to return home to Southern California from Las Vegas and vice versa. According to Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority data, an average of over 44,000 automobiles cross the California-Nevada state line on I-15 per day in 2020. 2023. This project is also believed to generate $10 billion in economic impact, as well as creating 35,000 good-paying jobs. Company officials also aim to have trains that exceed speeds of 186 miles per hour, which is comparable to Japan's bullet trains, and they hope to do so by the time of the 2028 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. Senator Rosen spoke on the matter, stating that, this historic high-speed rail project is a game-changer for Nevada's tourism, economy, and transportation. Not only will it bring more visitors to our state and help create more good-paying jobs, it'll also reduce traffic on the I-15 and decrease carbon emissions. Senator Rosen had led efforts in Congress in order to make the high-speed rail project happen, such as sending a letter urging the U.S. Department of Transportation to prepare for an application for funding to build Brightline West, as well as a conference in Vegas calling the Department of Transportation to approve said application. In addition to this, back in December, she also announced that she had secured $3 billion through the bipartisan infrastructure law to help with the construction fees of this project. Well, Las Vegas is the entertainment capital of the world. So our Sin City correspondent, Maria Sinters, is joining us now with a major headliner. The best-selling female artist of all time, Mariah Carey, is finally back here performing in Sin City with her knockout show, Mariah Carey, The Celebration of Mimi, live in Las Vegas residency. Faith, hope, and believing in yourself are major components of her spectacular show where a beautiful Mariah dazzled the audience. Mariah's mesmerizing voice can be heard at Dolby Live inside the Park MGM in celebration of the upcoming 20th anniversary of Carrie's critically acclaimed album, The Emancipation of Mimi. As Carrie's residency has been a total hit, the one and only artist recently added new dates that run from July 26th until August 10th, while previously scheduled performances began on April 12th and conclude on the 27th. The highly anticipated concert was made complete with Mariah's adorable twins Monroe and Moroccan Cannon in the audience, while supermodels Tyra Banks and Heidi Klum touched up Carrie's makeup on stage, much to the delight of the crowd. Reporting from the Las Vegas Strip, I'm Maria Centers with Southern Nevada News Network. Hopefully Mariah won't be such a heartbreaker, see what I did there, when she offers her voice once again, hopefully during this holiday season. News 25 will be right back.
You're watching News 25. Local coverage you can count on. News 25 is brought to you by Mountain West Lawyers, Injury Attorneys, 727-9500. Welcome back. Well, Pets Are Worth Saving is holding another one of their famous spaghetti fundraisers coming up next Saturday. So News 25 is speaking with Connie Alston, who's telling us more about it. Hi, it's Connie from Paws again. I'd like to invite you to our spaghetti dinner that's coming up on the 27th of April at the VFW. It's to benefit the children of Paws, the dogs, the cats, anything furry. Uh, we need your help and we need your support as a community. Uh, that one we're having will have a trash to treasure auction. We will have the spaghetti dinner starting at 2 o'clock. Um, there is an open bar and we will have lots of fun prizes. We'll have some raffles going on and we'll just have a rounding good time. So please join us at PAWS um, at, over at the VFW. Um, our local VFW and have a good day. Thank you very much. Well, do you ever wonder what exactly happens when there's a power outage? Well, Valley Electric Association is here sharing with us what it takes to turn the lights back on. This segment of News 25 is brought to you by Valley Electric and its family of companies focused on serving our members. We're better together. When the power goes out, most of us expect it to come back on within a few hours, but sometimes major storms cause widespread damage and outages can last longer than expected. The good news is that your electric co-op's line crews work long, hard hours to restore service safely to the greatest number of members. That's you in the shortest time possible. Ever wonder how they do it? Well, there are four steps to restoring power that we should all know about, especially when we find ourselves in the dark. Step one, repair high voltage transmission lines. Transmission towers and lines supply power to thousands of members. They rarely fall, but when they do, they must be repaired first before other parts of the system can operate. Step two, inspect distribution substation. Distribution substations receive high voltage power from transmission lines, then disperse that power at a lower voltage to the co-op's main distribution lines. Depending on your electric co-op service territory, distribution substations can serve either hundreds or thousands of members. When a major power outage occurs, the co-op's line crews inspect the substation to determine if the problem stems from the transmission lines feeding into the substation, the substation itself, or if the problem is further down the line. Step 3. Check main distribution lines. If the problem cannot be isolated at a distribution substation, the main distribution lines are checked first. These lines carry power to large groups of members in your electric co-op's service territory. Step 4. Examine tap lines. If local outages persist, supply lines called tap lines are examined. These lines deliver power to transformers that are either mounted on poles or placed on pads for underground service and can be found outside of homes, businesses, and schools. Occasionally, damage will occur on the service lines between the nearest transformer and your home. Has your neighbor ever had power while yours is out? That is why. When the problem is in the tap lines, co-op line crews will fix outages in an order that will restore service to the greatest number of members at a time. As you can see, restoring power after a major outage is a big job and involves much more than simply flipping a switch or removing a tree from a damaged line. When co-ops work to restore power, they often have the capability to work on multiple parts of the system simultaneously. This ensures reliable power with a faster response time. In the event of an outage, your local line crews will restore power safely to the greatest number of members in the shortest time possible and will keep working until the lights are back on. As always, we appreciate your patience and your business. News 25 Weather Cam is brought to you by Lerner and Row Injury Attorney's Office in Pahrump. In a wreck, need a check? Call 702-877-1500. 
Let's take a look outside through our Learner in Row weather cam at the beautiful April weather. There are light breezes, but not a cloud in the sky in that direction. We'll take a closer look at our forecast after the break. News 25 weather is brought to you by Dairy Council of Nevada. Undeniably delicious, undeniably dairy. Enjoy what's real. Good evening, Nevada. I am Rory Rosell here from the Channel 25 Weather Studios and streaming everywhere at kpvm.tv and now Roku. Taking a look at Nevada right now, up in northern Nevada, Fernley is at 73 degrees, Fallon is at 77, Carson City and Tonopah are sitting at 71 degrees, Goldfield is also at 73 degrees, Edie at 82, Amargosa in Las Vegas at 87 degrees, and Death Valley is at 98 degrees. Here in the Paradise of Prump, it is currently 84 degrees. The high today was 85 degrees. It was sunny today, wind blowing south at 14 miles per hour. The humidity was 12% today and the sun rose this morning at 5.59 a.m. and sets at 7.25 p.m. Humidity does go up to 32% and the wind continues to blow at southeast at 12 miles per hour. The low tonight is going to be 55 degrees with clear skies. Let's take a look at the rest of the week. It looks like we have a little bit of sun for the rest of the week until Friday when there is a chance of thunderstorms and we drop back down into the high 60s. But then on to the next week, we see the sun come back and we go back up into the sunny 80 degree weather. Back to the desk, here's you net. Thanks so much, Rory. And if you're looking for something to do tomorrow evening, CSN is always involved with the community and is inviting you to another enlightening event. We are streaming a award-winning documentary entitled Storming Caesar's Palace. That documentary is about local activist Ruby Duncan, who fought to secure wages in the 1960s throughout the Las Vegas area. And after that movie is screened, there will be a Q&A session with the movie's director and Duncan's daughter. That event is tomorrow on the CSN West Charleston campus from 4 p.m. until 6.30 p.m. in the K Building, room 101. And if you're unable to attend tomorrow's event, you can be sure to stream Storming Caesar's Palace for free on the PBS app. Well, that does it for this edition of News 25. I'm Yunette Gentry, and from all of us here at KPVM and Ace Country Radio, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you on the air next newscast. Good night.